that's a nice time to try that. Uh, we can get all of your input on what's worked best for you for virtual presentations and star parties and we have the virtual um, site set up on the Night Sky Network website so I'll put a link to that but I know you all have more experience than we do with this so I know Amy Oliver is on our is on the roster um, who did the best practices webinar for us earlier this year and she's on the roster for the uh, ASPs meeting this December to follow up on that topic I believe and she's just south from you Carl do you know Amy she's down at uh, what Whipple Observatory right you know I Smithsonian I'm not sure if I know her and I've spent I used to spend a lot of time at the Mount Hopkins there at Whipple but I haven't been there in about 10 years now okay yeah. All right, so we're almost, almost there. I know. So another reminder before we start going to, uh, for everyone in the chat, please make sure that you go down there and change your settings. So it says two panelists and attendees. And that includes the uh, panelists, because often we'll sometimes forget yeah, as well. Yeah, so that's true for us as well. Very easy to forget. <laughs> I just changed mine. I always mix it up. <laughs> so with my presentation in uh, presenter mode, I don't think I can see the chat at all. So if you know a good question comes up, like you said, just break in and let me know. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. Well, let me uh, go ahead and start recording here. So we are at the top of the hour and so welcome and ho hello everyone and welcome to the November NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We're hosting tonight's webinar from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California and from upstate New York and we have our guest speaker Carl Hergenrother. Did I say that right I hope? Uh, from the Rother, close enough. <laughs> okay from the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. And so welcome to everyone joining us both on Zoom and the YouTube live stream. We're very happy to have all of you with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the NASA Night Sky Network. And uh, we're, we're glad that uh, other people who aren't necessarily in the Night Sky Network can join us on YouTube. For more information about the NASA Night Sky Network, um, there should be a link uh, somewhere on the YouTube page for this video as well as the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So check those links. But before we get started with uh, Carl, here's Dave Prosper with just a few announcements. All righty. Hi, folks. So I just have a couple of items here. Just make sure. OK, for one, we have, oh, I'm just switching to views here. OK. Um, we have just a little bit of news, uh, mostly follow-ups from the last couple of uh, announcements. Uh, we have news about the pins. They should be arriving uh, sometime in mid-December, and we're going to have information about that later on this week, uh, just for folks who are wanting to order uh, requirements and so on. And uh, we know that uh, outreach, along with a lot of other things this year, has been a bit of a challenge, and we do want to recognize everyone's efforts, big and small, online and in person. So that's why we'll have some updated and looser requirements. And so that'll be in your inboxes by the end of this week, if all goes well, along with a uh, notice of the latest uh, Night Sky Notes. If you're subscribed to that newsletter, I try to have them out by the 15th of the month when all goes well. But I uh, made the uh, mistake of taking some time off at the beginning of the month. <laughs> it's messed up my schedule a bit. Um, the article is almost done and we'll hopefully have that out to you in the next couple of days too, at least by the 20th, which is our kind of our kind of our cutoff date for that. And, um, but probably the most uh, exciting news for some folks is that we actually have uh, more planet stickers uh, created by uh, Gerilyn Ramirez. She's, people love the stickers and uh, we let Gerilyn know, and she has uh, flushed out the rest of the solar system. And uh, you can find those at bit.ly slash I saw planets or at the link I just put in the chat here. And that's all I have. That's for our program news. Uh, back to you, Brian. All right, thanks, Dave. So for those of you on Zoom, you can find the chat window and the Q&A window at the bottom edge of the Zoom window on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window making sure that you select uh, panel, two panelists and attendees at the bottom. 
If you have any technical difficulties, you can send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. If you have a question for Carl this evening uh, that you would like him to answer, please type it into the Q&A window, not the chat window. Please put it in the Q&A window. That helps us keep track of it and we don't lose it uh, amongst all the greetings of uh, um, you know, possibly hundreds of chat messages that we have there. So again, I'd like to welcome everyone to the November webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Carl Hergenrother to our webinar. Carl is an observational astronomer at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, specializing in the study of comets and asteroids. He's a member of the science team for the NASA OSIRIS-REx mission. With OSIRIS-REx, he's responsible for leading the effort to select and remotely characterize Bennu, monitoring the near Bennu space for ejected particles and helping to coordinate the target asteroid citizen science project. And it's possible that some of you have participated in that. And if you happen to have done the target asteroid citizen science program, um, put a little jot something into the chat and let us know if you've participated in that. I think that Carl would love to hear um, from any of you that may be uh, involved with that. Carl is also an avid backyard observer where his go-to equipment are a pair of 30 by 125 binoculars. He enjoys visually observing comets, meteor showers, and galactic mildew, and is also the comet section coordinator and associate director of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, or ALPO. Please welcome Carl. Thanks for having me. So hopefully soon we will see my title page. There we go. <laughs> there we go, it looks great. Okay, great. So yeah, thanks for having me. I'm from you know, clear, dark and still warm Tucson. I believe this is actually the second OSIRIS-REx talk that has been presented to the uh, Night Sky Network. Uh, Ed Bayshore, who was at, our, at the time our deputy principal investigator, uh, talked to everyone about a few weeks right before our launch back in 2016. So what exactly is OSIRIS-REx? Well, it's a, it's a NASA funded spacecraft mission. And in fact, it's a New Frontiers class mission to go to a nearby near Earth asteroid called Bennu, characterize it, collect a sample from its surface and bring that sample back to Earth for study and analysis in 2023. Like a lot of missions nowadays, its name is an acronym. The days of Voyager 1 and 2 are kind of gone. This I think would have been New Frontiers 3 if we had gone with the old naming. But OSIRIS-REx itself is an acronym and the acronym kind of spells out the main science investigations that we were primarily interested in. The reason why we went to Bennu is because it's a carbonaceous asteroid. Carbonaceous asteroids are usually carbon rich, can oftentimes be have water. And the reason why it's really interesting is that they haven't changed much over the history of the solar system. Um, unlike a lot of other bodies like the earth or even S type asteroids that had a lot of radioactive metals when they formed. So you had a lot of isotopic decay. Carbonaceous asteroids didn't experience that. So they never melted, they never heated up. They didn't differentiate like the earth does where you got the heavy stuff in the core lighter stuff floating on the surface. So going to an asteroid like Bennu is like going kind of back in time to the formation of the planets and the early solar system. There's also a belief that asteroids like Bennu, these carbonaceous asteroids, delivered much of the water as well as possibly even the organics that we ourselves are made of to Earth. So that's where the origins comes in. The next part of the name is spectral interpretation, the SI. There's a million or so asteroids that we know about there's hundreds of thousands of meteorites and they don't quite look the same. We know the meteorites are coming from the asteroids, but there's a disconnect there. So hopefully by going to an asteroid that we've intensively studied from the ground and now we've studied and characterized from orbit and now bringing samples back, we can better interpret what our ground-based telescopes are saying about the other million or so asteroids. RI, resource identification. Humanity is already a spacefaring species. And at some point, we're going to be an interplanetary species. And when we do that, we're going to have to learn how to live out there among the other planets, the comets and the asteroids. And the asteroids, especially the near-Earth asteroids, are going to probably end up being the gas stations of the future. 
where you can drop off and get your building supplies. You can collect hydrogen, you can collect carbon, you can collect water and water is great for a lot of things. Not only is it great for drinking, it also can be used as a fuel. And of course you need it for growing plants and such. Security, we know asteroids are dangerous. We know asteroids hit the earth every day. They're usually small, so you only see them as meteors, but we know in the past asteroids have caused some bad times here on earth. And one of these days that may happen again. As it turns out, the asteroid Bennu, though we did not know this when we selected the asteroid back in 2005, actually has a one in 2,700 chance of hitting the Earth in the latter quarter of the 22nd century. That may sound high, but that's still a 99.97 or 96% chance of not hitting the Earth. But by going to an asteroid like Bennu and studying it at least thermally and trying to figure out how the Yarkovsky effect is pushing it around, we can update and refine the models we use for predicting other potentially hazardous asteroids in the future. And then Rex, Regolith Explorer. Regolith is kind of sciencey speak for dirt. Um, it actually comes from the Greek, it's called, uh, it, the Greek meaning is blanket rock. It's basically the fine material that covers the bedrock. So on earth, that would be soil, that would be dirt, it'd be volcanic ash. On the asteroid, it's the fine particles. And of course, not only did we characterize most of the surface of the asteroid, it's this regolith that we will eventually be taking back to Earth. Again, true a lot of missions, OSIRIS-REx is a collaboration between a number of different groups. We have the University of Arizona, which is running the science team, NASA Goddard, which is doing the overarching management, as well as running a lot of things like helping with navigation, and they've contributed an instrument. Lockheed Martin was the aerospace company that built the spacecraft. And then we've got other smaller universities, not smaller universities, but other universities like Arizona State, MIT and Harvard that contributed instruments. And then there's a private company called Kinetics and they're the ones who do a lot of our navigation. So they're the ones who are really flying the spacecraft through the solar system and around the asteroid. And we also have significant contributions from the Canadian Space Agency who uh, contributed an instrument and CNES, which is the, uh, the French space agency. Now, OSIRIS-REx is what's called a PI-led mission or a competed mission. Not all, a lot of missions, NASA, there's kind of the scientists, NASA and Congress get together and decide we're gonna do a sample return mission from Mars or we're gonna you know, send Cassini to Saturn. But they also have two programs, one of which is Discovery and the other one is New Frontiers, where they ask the astronomical community to submit ideas for a mission. And in 2004, we submitted our first proposal. At the time, it was just OSIRIS. It was very much a bare bones mission. It was just the sample collector head and a camera. And we submitted it to the Discovery Program. And the Discovery Program has produced a lot of the planetary missions that were, you know, that we've seen over the last couple of years, um, going all the way back to near Shoemaker and Mars Pathfinder in the late 90s. Uh, the most current one is InSight, which is on Mars. And then there's two asteroid missions, Lucy and Psyche, that will be launched in the coming years. So we submitted in 2004 and didn't get selected. In fact, no mission got selected. Then we submitted again in 2007 and we made it to phase A. You can almost think of it as like the finals, the playoffs. We were one of three missions that were selected. Ultimately, GRAIL, which went to the moon to measure the, the gravity of the moon and the internal structure of the moon was selected. But we decided after kind of losing out on discovery twice that we needed to bump up to the next largest category of mission, which was New Frontiers. And New Frontiers was, has produced New Horizons, which of course went to Pluto a few years back and then flew by Arakoth, which was a Kuiper Belt object. Juno, which is currently at Jupiter. And then OSIRIS-REx in 2011 and 2012 was selected as the third New Frontiers mission. And since then, an additional mission, Dragonfly, which is going to be flying a copter around Titan, was selected. So thanks to bumping up to the higher New Frontiers class, we were able to take that bare bones OSIRIS concept and really flesh it out with a lot of great instrumentation to help characterize the asteroid. And that's really where the Rex comes in. It was kind of a joke that, you know, Os the new proposal was OSIRIS Rex. It was a step further than the old proposal. Like any, uh, like most spacecraft, especially if you're going to another body, you've got cameras. So we've got a series, in fact, we have six cameras, not counting the star trackers that are on this mission. Uh, three cameras are considered science cameras and they were developed at the University of Arizona. One is Polycam, which is a 20 centimeter, eight inch aperture. So it's, it's fast, it's about an F3. 
So you can kind of think of it as your C8, except with one of those uh, night owls from Star Arizona plugged in there. So one KCCD field of view is about 0.8 degrees, and it's designed for not only observing and detecting the asteroid when we were far away, but also as a focus mechanism that gets us down to stay in focus down to about 200 meters off the surface. So it also was our kind of zoom in camera as well when we were doing close flybys at a surface. Unfortunately, for to make things a little less risky and to minimize moving parts, our cameras either have a focus mechanism or a filter wheel. And for pan cam, we went with the focus mechanism. So it only has a single panchromatic, you can think of it as a luminance filter. Stepping down in size, we had map cam, which is a, basically it's effectively 125 millimeter F3 telephoto lens. This one, we didn't have a focus mechanism. Instead, we had a filter wheel. And again, we had the luminance filter, but we also so had a B and V filter. We had eight, actually they were part of the eight color asteroid system. And the B and V is the same as the Johnson B and V that a lot of you probably use for you know, variable star photometry and asteroid tree. And then there were two other filters that go out into the red W and X that were primarily their placement was designed, was, was optimized to differentiate between different kinds of asteroids. And in the filter wheel, we actually put in a little diopter, kind of like a little uh, eyeglass little reading glass in there so we could actually image the surface at 30 meters when we were dropping down to the surface. And the final size camera was SAMCAM, which is a much smaller instrument, has a 20 degree field of view, and it's really designed for just imaging the sample head as we actually collect stuff off the surface. We also have three navigators. FCAM, NFT cam, and STOCAM. In fact, STOCAM's sole purpose is just to take pictures of the sample return capsule. And you'll see pictures of us actually stowing the sample within the sample return capsule. And the other two were, one was designed NFT cam to actually map the surface as we were descending. So there's like terrain recognition software running on that. And AFCAM was kind of the workhorse for taking pictures of the stars and the asteroid every two hours over almost the entire mission to make sure we knew exactly where the spacecraft was with respect to the asteroid. So as it turns out, MAPCAM turned out to be a pretty important science instrument as well. We have two spectrometers. We have a visible and infrared spectrometer, which covers the visible wavelength starting at 0.4 micron. So basically again, your B filter out to around four micron. We also have OTIS, which is a thermal spectrometer, which kind of takes, starts off where Oviers lets off, there's a little bit of a gap at around five, six micron, goes out to 100 micron. So it really is taking the temperature of the asteroid. OLA, which was our contribution from the Canadian Space Agency, is a point laser altimeter. And it was able to, as long as we were within about seven kilometers of the asteroid, it could detect the asteroid. And it can run at rates as high as 10 kilohertz. And it's got a mirror, so it's actually wasn't just pointing directly down, it was actually scanning and scanning across the surface of the asteroid. So actually rotating is a map of the surface of the asteroid, not so much an image, but a combination of millions of these range points that were taken by this instrument. And then the last instrument is REXIS, which was actually a student-built instrument. We had a competition for various uh, universities around the country to come up with a student instrument to go on OSIRIS-REx. And they built an, a regular, what they call the X-ray imaging spectrometer. So it's looking at something. Now the asteroid itself emit x but if there's a flare, you will actually get luminance of material and that will actually be able to be detected by the, by the instrument. And the movie I'm showing there was them, they actually detected a X-ray outburst from a black hole, which was kind of cool. So why Bennu? Now, the reason why we went there is because we wanted to go to carbonaceous asteroid. But why that carbonaceous asteroid? When we were making this decision back in 2005, there were about a half million asteroids that were known. But you, did, you couldn't go to all of them because most of them are orbiting too far from the Earth. It would take too long, require too large of a rocket, just too much money to get to. So you go to near-Earth asteroids, those objects that do come close to the Earth. And that dropped that number of 500,000 to about 7,000. But even of those near-Earth asteroids, most are, in, most are in orbits that, again, take you too close to the sun, too far from the sun. There's too much inclination. Again, it's too much of an effort to get there. 
So if you only want to go to those objects that have what we call low delta V orbits that don't take a lot of energy to get to, you're now under 200. And most of those objects in Earth-like orbits are way too small. They were discovered, followed for a few days, and are now lost. Or if we still have track of them, they're rotating too fast. Some of them are rotating less than a minute, like that. And for something rotating so fast, does it even have regular thunder Did it all get thrown off? So now you're down to about two dozen. And the, at the time, a lot of those objects weren't characterized. So there are only five carbonaceous objects that we knew of. And it really came down to two asteroids, Ryugu, which is where the Japanese Space Agency just went to with Hayabusa 2, and Bennu. And the reason why we ultimately went with Bennu was because we actually knew what its shape was, because we had radar observations from the NASA Goldstone Telescope and the Arecibo Telescope. So had it not been for those radar observations, maybe we would have gone to Ryugu and the Japanese would have gone to Bennu. If we were to do this exercise now, there's a few more carbonaceous objects that have been discovered and, and characterized in the meantime, but it's really not a lot of objects you can go to. And these objects are not big. I mean, Bennu is only about a half kilometer across, and that's like less than a third of a mile. So it's not a large object. As you can see, it's not much taller than the Empire State Building. When you compare it to the, the recent small asteroids that we do, like Itokawa that the first Hayabusa mission went to, or Ryugu that the second one went to, you can see Bennu is actually a lot smaller than Ryugu. And if you took Itokawa and you kind of smushed it from that sausage shape into a, you know, a dough ball, it's probably smaller than Bennu. So Bennu kind of fits in the middle. When you compare these objects to all of the quote unquote small bodies, and a lot of planetary astronomers consider small bodies to be almost any asteroid or comet. I mean, Bennu and Ryugu are right here, much smaller than even 67P, which was the comet that uh, the Rosetta mission went to. And Ceres and Vesta don't even make the cut on here, but they would actually be five to 10 times larger than this large object here, Letitia. So we launched the OSIRIS-REx mission in September 2016. And then we, we were in a one-year orbit, flew past the Earth in September 2017, and that gave us enough of a kick to be in Bennu's orbital plane. And then we slowly caught up. And the first image of the asteroid was taken in August of 2018. We spent the next couple of months in what we called our approach phase as we were getting progressively closer and closer to the asteroid. And then we kind of, we considered our arrival December 1st of 2018. And that was when we were no longer approaching the asteroid, but we were starting to do maneuver, either going into orbit or doing maneuvers around the asteroid to observe it at different observing circumstances, observing it at different phase angles or different solar times. So for much of 2019, we were in this alternating back and forth between going into orbit as well as maneuvering around the asteroid. And then the latter half or the last few months of 2019 and most of 2020 was doing what we called reconnaissance and rehearsals, where we had picked our sample sites and we're now making very close flybys to get higher resolution, as well as practicing the descent down to the surface. And then we finally got made our sample collection almost a month ago, October 20th of this year. Now, when we're orbiting or flying by the asteroid, like I said before, the asteroid's small. It's only a 33rd of a mile across, 500 meters across. We can get really close. In fact, most of our orbits were within about one and a half kilometers of the asteroid, and some were down to about 0.8 kilometers. And so, <clears throat> and even at such a small orbit, a 0.8 kilometer orbit still takes you 24 hours to go around it. This grab, there's, you know, Bennu's small and doesn't have a lot of gravity. When we were out at 1.5, 1.8 kilometers, it took almost three days to orbit the asteroid. And our orbit, I should have put a, shown a graphic there, but our orbit was what we call the terminator orbit. So if the sun is off to the side, we were actually orbiting in the terminator of the asteroid. And the reason for that is that's actually dynamically stable. If you have your solar panels pointed at the sun, you will actually have a balance between solar radiation pressure forces and the gravity of the asteroid. If you're going in front of or behind the asteroid, solar radiation pressure will start pushing on the spacecraft, elongate the orbit, <coughs> and ultimately you'll end up crashing into the asteroid. So we always went into a terminator orbit, which was nice and stable. So for the first few months, we started approaching Bennu. 
and we had all these ground-based observations. We had these great radar observations. One of the reasons why we picked Bennu was because it looked like its surface was benign. We knew there was one big boulder, and you can actually see it rotating right there, Ben Ben. And there wasn't much else. And we thought from the thermal inertia observations we got from Spitzer, as well as the radar observations, that the surface was probably pretty flat, had lots of fine material, wasn't going to be rocky. And we've seen asteroids fly by, and we pinged them with radar, and there were boulders everywhere. But as we closed in, you start going, uh-oh, there are rocks everywhere on this thing. And there wasn't the nice little playas that we saw on some of the asteroids like Itokawa and Eros, which were like these little, almost sandy beaches. And as we zoomed in and got closer, I mean, there were rocks and boulders everywhere. In fact, one major region of the asteroid we just kind of informally called Boulder Town. And you look in there and you go, well, geez, where is any of the fine material? And how do you <clears throat> get close to an asteroid like that and collect any sample? So that was the first real surprise that this object, contrary to the ground-based observations, was a lot rockier than we really were expecting. And now this is the part of the talk where I start presenting a lot of the really cool science that we produced on the mission. So we knew Bennu was gonna be a dark asteroid. We knew from the ground-based and the Spitzer and Hubble observations, it has an albedo of 4% on average. 4% is dark. That's, that's a few times darker than fresh blacktop. And that's about the same albedo as coal. So it's a really dark object. <clears throat> so it was kind of surprising when we got there that there were, you know, okay, dark boulders, but there are also brighter boulders. And in some cases, really bright boulders. And that was a bit of a head scratcher. We knew the asteroid was slightly blue. It was a B-type asteroid. And B-type asteroids are, by definition, when you do the spectroscopy, slightly blue. Most asteroids are neutral or red, but the B types are blue. But even when we looked at the surface of Bennu, we saw evidence of red boulders and red material. And so it does look like what we're seeing here possibly is the different colors and the different albedos are really telling you something about the age of the material. Not so much the age of when it formed in the grand history of the solar system, but how long has it been on the surface of the asteroid? <coughs> So if the average terrain, which is this light blue, and we think that means surface that's on average at least greater than 200,000 years old, or has been on the surface for more than 200,000 years old, that the first thing that happens to it is it slightly bluens. It actually gets brighter and turns blue. But it turns out the freshest material is actually the red dark stuff. And what we're thinking is going on here is that if you took a shovel, you dug down into the regolith of Bennu, you would uncover red material. And so the red material we are seeing on the surface is stuff that was just recently uncovered, <clears throat> perhaps by a landslide, perhaps by a meteoroid impact producing a crater. And you can actually see where the craters themselves, the fresh small craters, have this little red hue. So this might actually be a red hue. So this is actually probably the material that's been on the surface for the least amount of time. Another interesting thing is we saw a series of boulders some of which were quite bright. I mean, many times brighter than the dark material. And they had a different, looked like they were made of a different mineralogy. In fact, it looked like they had pyroxene in them. And pyroxene is an igneous rock. And Bennu should not have had any kind of volcanic activity at any time in its history. It never should have gotten warm enough for that. So what exactly was creating these really bright boulders that we're seeing? As it turns out, spectrally, these actually match the spectrum of Vesta, which was the, uh, the second largest asteroid, or third largest asteroid. It's definitely the brightest asteroid in the Mimo. <coughs> and Vesta was just recently visited by the Dawn spacecraft. And so Vesta lives in the inner solar, inner main belt. We think Bennu came from the inner main belt as well. So it's very possible that when Bennu was either in the inner main belt or possibly part of a much larger asteroid that then broke up, <clears throat> that at some point, pieces of Vesta, you can say, contaminated this carbonaceous object. Now, our best understanding of how Bennu got to where it is, is that it originally formed in a much larger, maybe 100 kilometer, 200 kilometer asteroid <clears throat> in the inner solar system, carbonaceous. 
And maybe as that asteroid was going around the sun for the first couple billion years of the solar system, it was collecting basically debris, sweeping up debris that was falling on it. And some of that debris was pieces of Vesta. This large object must have been destroyed at some point because it's not there anymore. And it also would explain how Bennu got liberated. But it's possible that impactor that came in and hit the primordial Bennu parent body was a piece of Vesta, or at least had Vesta-like qualities. And what would happen is the asteroid would be shattered, and then the smaller pieces like Bennu would actually reaccumulate from the debris that had been released by the impact. So when the impact happened, it didn't just throw out a big Bennu piece. It threw out a lot of little pieces, and then Bennu formed from that. So if the impactor, the impact E was carbonaceous, the impactor was related to Vesta, <coughs> the new reaccumulated Bennu could have pieces of both. Or it's possible that you just had impacts from Vestoid pieces just falling on the surface as Bennu was spending the next half billion years or so in the main belt before it was finally kicked into the inner solar system. Now what's interesting is we kind of should have expected this. Um, you remember back 2008, there was a 2008 TC3, which was an asteroid that was discovered by the Catalina Sky Survey right before it hit the Earth's atmosphere and actually landed in the Sudan. It was picked up as the Almohada Siddha meteor fall. And for an object that was only about four meters across, so it wasn't very big, the thinking would be, well, it's all gonna be the same kind of material. But in fact, it had a bunch of different meteorite types within it. So it was a breccia or a conglomeration of a bunch of different meteorite types. So it must have originally been on the surface of a larger asteroid and all these types just kind of these different meteorite types kind of got merged and melded together. And, and so that was the first sign that, okay, maybe these objects aren't quite as homogenous as we were expecting. It also turns out we probably knew this in 1969 because there was a famous fall just across the border here in Mexico called Allende. <coughs> and that was a carbonaceous asteroid. But even among that fall, they were finding meteorites that didn't quite match the type. And at the time, there was a question of, well, is that, were those meteorites related to Allende? Or maybe it was something that fell in the distant past. And as people are looking for the fresh fall, they're finding older stuff as well. So it does look like there's been a lot of mixing and matching of different types of asteroids and stuff in the solar system. We definitely are detecting evidence of surface changes on the surface. Um, we've seen large craters, we've even seen small craters, almost like, you know, you're getting a little shotgun blast on a surface of a rock. And it was kind of cool because you can actually count the craters on what should have been a fresh surface and derive how long that surface has been there, as well as how long the asteroid has been in the Earth's space. And the current estimate is that Bennu left the main belt a little under 2 million years ago, give or take half a million years or so. So it's been in the, spent about two million years in the inner solar system. And we also see evidence of mass movement. We're seeing <clears throat> where boulders have shifted. We're seeing where material is burying boulders. And a lot of that movement seems to be shifting from the higher latitudes to the equator. One of the biggest surprises of this mission was a week after we entered orbit, and this was actually one of my discoveries. I was flipping through the navigation images. And one of my prime responsibilities during approach was to look for satellites, look for cometary activity. Not only for science reasons, but because it could be a hazard to the spacecraft, especially when we're flying in close proximity. And during that approach, we didn't detect anything unusual. Not surprising, we didn't see anything in the radar data. Even though we know a quarter of all near-Earth asteroids have satellites, that means three quarters of them don't. So not surprising, we didn't see anything. And then all of a sudden I'm flipping through the data and I notice what looks like a star cluster sitting right off the northern limb of the asteroid. <coughs> and these images only go down to six, seventh magnitude. So, and this is a 38 by 44 degree field of view. So you would, and, you know, as you're flipping through, you'd see the familiar constellations go by. There goes Orion, there goes Lyra. You'd see the, <clears throat> the beehive. So it was a star cluster I never recognized. So I was basically using my backyard experience here. So of course, what do I do? I pull up Stellarium and I go, okay, it says we're pointed here. And it was in Hydra. 
I'm like, well, there's no star cluster in hydrate. It looks like this, nothing this large. And then after a while, I finally was able to realize that most of these stars aren't stars. And then when you stretch the image, especially here, you notice that as you get far away from the asteroid, these little points become more and more elongated, like they're streaks moving away. And when I, you know, just sat there in DS9 and drew lines back to the surface, realized they all seem to converge or emanate from a point on the surface. So here was evidence that something just happened on the surface of Bennu. Something was actually throwing off material. <clears throat> so perhaps this was an active asteroid. Um, active asteroids are objects that we think dynamically, as well as spectrally, shouldn't be comets. They should have spent most of the history of the solar system in the main belt, close enough to the sun that they should have been thoroughly baked through or pretty close to that. So they, they shouldn't have re you know, ready reservoirs of ices that would produce cometary activity. And yet these objects do show evidence of some sort of activity. And just to show you kind of how busy the asteroid is, every once in a while you'll see a major release of particles. You'll see a particle kind of fall into a temporary orbit <coughs> and stay there for a couple of days, but then crash back down on the surface. And we're estimating that about 10 kilograms of material is ejected from Bennu, every Bennu orbit. And it takes 1.2 years to circle the sun. About 30% of that material escapes Bennu completely. It doesn't fall back on the surface. It goes, basically creates a Bennuid meteor stream behind the asteroid. Now that may sound three kilograms of material every year or every 1.2 years. They sound like a lot of material. It's actually not if you actually take that rate and assume it continues into the future, it would take much longer, a few times longer than the history, age of the solar system to completely erode away Bennu. But it does suggest that even these inert asteroids are shedding material. They are acting maybe comet-like. And so, as I said, you know, active asteroids are comets formed Outer solar system, a lot of ices, gravitational perturbations kick them back into the inner solar system. And you have dust and gas out gassing creates coma and tail. The active asteroids should not be active. And there's a lot of different reasons for why they might be active. And in the past, there's been suggestions that maybe they are really like comets. There, there still is some ice, that significant amount of ice under the surface. <coughs> And that's sublimating and creating more traditional cometary activity. We have seen objects that look like they were just impacted by something. You know, like Sheila is a good example. Here's an object that's, you know, tens of kilometers across, probably got hit by something a few meters across. And what you saw was the debris that was kicked off that asteroid. The rocks themselves might be cracking. Um, take, for example, Bennu, it rotates every 4.3 hours. So that's a lot of thermal cycling, a lot of the rocks you know, expanding and contracting every 4.3 hours as you hit the thermal cycle. And that is actually weakening the rocks. And of course, it's a microgravity environment. So if all of a sudden your rock pops and forms a crack, you can throw material off and even escape the asteroid. Some minerals themselves might just be thermally disassociating because of heat as well. <coughs> There's electrostatic levitation. Um, where just because of the solar wind and stuff impinging on the surface, you can actually build up a charge and this has been seen on the moon and should occur on asteroids as well, where you get electrostatics and it levitates particles off the surface. And then if you have another force, it can kick those off as well. And if you get close enough to the sun, and we've seen this with Phaethon, which is the geminid uh, meteor parent body, you can have the solar wind is dense enough. It could actually sweep across the surface like a wind and blow stuff off the surface. And then finally, we have objects that just, they spin up, they rotate too fast and they actually disrupt and throw material off. The structural integrity of the body fails and it throws material off. And in some cases it completely disintegrates and breaks into smaller pieces. We did a real deep dive study on Bennu and what was causing this activity. And it does appear that it is most likely due to meteoroid impacts and thermal fracturing, this thermal cycling of rocks, probably both. A really recent result, and in fact, you may have seen some news stories just in the last week, 
is thanks to these particles, because they're nice little gravity test particles in orbit around the asteroid, we were able to really accurately measure the internal structure <coughs> of the asteroid itself. And what we're finding is that the core region, as well as the equatorial bulge region, are actually less dense than the rest of the asteroid. And we're not 100% sure why that is. It's possible that the equatorial region, because material is moving down from higher latitudes, and it turns out those particles preferentially crash into the equatorial region as well, that you just get an accumulation of material. And because the object's spinning, not quite at breakup velocities, but at least at the equator, there's less gravity just because of centripetal forces, that you just don't have packing. And so you've got a less dense ring. And as for why the core is less dense, we're not really sure. It could be because at some point, either it's a relic of Bennu's formation, it formed that way, or at some point in the past, it did spin up <clears throat> and a lot of material left the core region and moved outwards. So as I said before, once we got into latter 2018 and into 20, sorry, latter 2019 into 2020, we started doing a lot of these flybys. And we dropped down, once we had picked our sample sites, we started doing what we called recon passes. Like for example, recon C, we got down to about 250 meters, which is about 800 feet. And even did some rehearsals where we dropped down to about 130 feet off the surface. And we had selected, we had a whole kind of March Madness kind of thing where we started with, <coughs> I think it was 16 potential sites, down selected to eight, picked our final four, and then from that final four, we went with our primary site, which we called Nightingale. And these are all bird names because the asteroid Bennu is actually a bird from Egyptian mythology. And our backup site, which was Osprey. And just to kind of put in context the size of this, it's not a lot. As you can see, it's a few parking spots. And that blue circle was the bullseye we were aiming for. <clears throat> and what we did with the spacecraft is it actually did have terrain recognition software on board. So it didn't actually control the spacecraft, but what happened is the spacecraft was ascending. It's kind of like throwing a dart at a dartboard and it was taking pictures of the dartboard as it's going in. And if it notices that it's on target, it will continue. If it were to notice that it weren't, wasn't on target and was gonna actually end up tagging a dangerous part of the surface, it would have aborted and we would have tried again. But luckily everything worked on that first try. And so the spacecraft did not land on the surface. What we did is we, what we call tagged it, touch and go. We dropped, and if you can remember the old car air filters, the round ones you drop in, screw down, that's what this is. This is one of those old car air filters. You drop it on the surface. There was canisters of inert nitrogen gas that would then blow through, blow into the surface, <coughs> mobilize the regolith, which would then be caught by these little catches that are in the side there. We only expect it to be on the surface for a few seconds. So this is the video of SamCam <coughs> centered up on the head of the head of the uh, tag arm as we descended and then as the canisters blew. This is a little longer image. This is actually the nav cam as we start descending to the asteroid. And this took about four hours. <coughs> as you can see, we're moving around, shifting things. And about now, actually spoke too soon. There, there's a little flat region. There is our sample site. We start descending closer and closer. And as we get really close, you'll start to see the shadow of the sample head. There it goes. And then all chaos breaks loose. And after about five, six seconds on the surface, the thrusters engage and we back off. And pretty much everything you're seeing in this image, and I will actually go to the next slide because I cut out the, the beginning stuff so we can kind of keep playing the, the really interesting stuff here. Almost everything you're seeing in this image is debris that has been kicked off the surface. Finally, when we get far enough away, down here, you can probably see the asteroid surface through the debris. And what we're thinking is that there's 
these dark regions are probably shadows that the debris has kicked up. It's casting shadows on the surface. The shadow up here is from the actual tag event itself. And then there's four thrusters on the four corners of the spacecraft. And each of those probably scoured the surface. And we think this shadow here was due to basically the debris being kicked up by one of those thrusters. And to kind of give an idea of the field of view here. So this is only about 10 meters across, which you look at this orange circle. And then we've got the red field of view. This is for SAM cam. And the green is the field of view for NFT cam there. So everything kind of makes sense. There's a boulder here that's starting to disappear from the field of view. Here comes the head itself. You can see NFT cam was offset from the head itself. And then we slowly start backing away. You got a whole bunch of material that's tumbling. And even this bright rock here is still something that's sitting there above the surface tumbling. Maybe it's fallen just on the surface, but as you can see, it shouldn't be there. So this is something that we had kicked up and then landed somewhere else on the surface. Now the plan for OSIRIS-REx was to collect at least 60 grams of material. <clears throat> it, as it turns out, we collected probably a lot more than that. Because to our surprise, we were going to do a whole bunch of what we call mass measurements. One was to just, like the image you're seeing here, take the sample head and you take a picture of it. You just look, do we have material inside there? Does it look like it's dirty? Does it look like it's actually collected something? And then we were going to do a moment of inertia test. We've already done this with the sample head empty. And then we were going to do this and just kind of do your little moment of inertia and try to figure out how much mass you've actually collected. But as soon as we started taking images of the collector head, we started noticing there was debris just falling out of the collector head. So we had so much material that it was actually overflowing the sample collector. So we decided, well, you know what? We're going straight to stow. We're not gonna do any more tests. And we think what happens, going back to this video, you'll see there's a little flap, mylar flap that opens to let the material in. And that flap should close. So much material was collected that flap was wedged open. So every time we were moving the collector head around now, we were losing material. And as you can see here, this is an image of us stowing the sample collector head into the sample return capsule. If you look closely, you can see small particles coming off. So there was still stuff falling out of this as we were stowing it. But luckily everything worked and it stowed successfully. And there's a nice picture of a closed capsule. So what's left for the mission? Uh, the Bennu encounter phase, the science phase, at least the asteroid science phase is over. So there's no more science collection currently planned. Uh, we're still in the vicinity of Bennu. We're you know tens to hundreds of kilometers away and slowly drifting away with time. And we will be there for a few more months before we actually do a maneuver and start our trip home. And ultimately, the samples will be returned to Earth in September 24th, 2023. And then at that point, just the sample return capsule lands on the Earth. The spacecraft itself will fly by the Earth. And who knows? The spacecraft's still in good working order. The the, other than the fact that all the instruments have a nice coating of Bennu dust on them, they're all still working. So maybe we will actually go somewhere else. Go do, we can't get samples from another asteroid, but we can go visit another object if NASA wants us to do that. And just to kind of close out the talk, especially since everyone's into amateur astronomy here, we did, and it was mentioned earlier on, we have the, it was a target asteroids program, which was run by OSIRIS-REx and the target NEOs program, which was part of the Astronomical League. Now that the OSIRIS-REx, the science is ramping down, everything's going over to the Astronomical League and we can continue the project of trying to enable people with you know, relatively modest backyard equipment using CCDs and CMOS detectors to do photometry of either asteroids similar to Bennu and Ryugu, similar near-Earth asteroids, or to do photometric observations of those objects that might have been parent bodies to objects like Bennu and Ryugu that are sitting out there in the main belt. 
And you know, we publish our papers in the Minor Planet Bulletin, and usually we, we combine all the data we get in order to drive colors, get rotation periods, phase functions, um, and trying to get more and more folks using star analyzers to do spectroscopy, which, I mean, honestly, you can only do it on the brighter objects, but still there's plenty of good bright carbonaceous main belt objects out there as well. And of course the mission, like I said, isn't over. We still are gonna be producing great science from TAG. We still have the sample return coming in 2023, as well as all the great ground analysis that will be done on those samples. And hopefully it'll be an extended mission for OSIRIS-REx as well. So we've got all over social media, like most missions on our website. So definitely come and visit us. And thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you so much. This is uh, really great. We've got a lot of really good uh, questions here. So let's get right to the questions. And so I, um, I don't know if you want to stop sharing or if uh, maybe you want to uh, leave it up and then be able to go back to uh, help answer the questions. And so yeah, it might be good. Just leave it up because okay. I can go back to a slide if I have one. So let's, um, we'll kind of jump around here a little bit. Some of these are related to each other. And so Ron, asked, at what point did you realize that Bennu was more rubble than rock and what was your reaction? So that was early on during that approach phase um, as the, you know, the asteroid was growing from, you know, one pixel across to 30 pixels to 100 pixels, 300 pixels. We quickly realized that this object was a lot rockier and bouldery than we were expecting. And it, there was concern there. There was a wonder that would we actually be able to deliver the spacecraft to the surface and collect something? And originally we were not gonna use natural, fe natural feature tracking. We were gonna drop down to the surface and we wanted to look for something, a clear spot that was at least 25 meters across. There was no part of Bennu that we can land where it was safe across the enti entire 25 meters. And that's actually that large circle that you're seeing here. So natural feature tracking was actually developed in order to ensure that we could land on a much smaller footprint successfully, and it worked. So yeah, it did drive a lot of development, the fact that the asteroid was less benign than we were expecting. Okay, so kind of sticking with the same general, um, I guess, topic, Ted wonders, uh, uh, so where did all the fine material go? Was it there and got tossed off or just never present? That is a good question. Um, it's possible it could be related to electrostatic levitation, like we mentioned as a possible uh, cause of these particles. Um, the reason why we didn't see any electrostatic levitation is because it's so efficient that it's already removed all the fine particles. As soon as they're being formed, they're being lofted off the surface and removed. There's actually uh, some idea that these objects are fairly porous and maybe fine material as the asteroid shakes, that falls into the surface. And it's the bigger stuff, kind of like what they call the Brazil nut problem, where the fine material, if you shake a can of Brazil nuts, the smaller pieces fall down, the bigger pieces rise to the surface. So maybe the fine materials inside the asteroid. Okay, Stephen asks, and I, I think it's related here, is the rate of loss of material off of asteroids considered static, linear, or nonlinear as it ages? Could a measured loss rate in a single year then be used to date the object? It probably, well, I'm not sure it's going to change with age of the asteroid, though it does change with its position in the solar system. The closer you get to the sun, the higher velocity of these meteoroid impacts, as well as the hotter the surface gets, so thermal fracturing becomes more of an issue. As the asteroid were actually to start eroding, it would get smaller and smaller. So you'd have less surface area being impacted or less surface area having thermal fracturing and the gravity would be less. So there are changes and we did think that we did detect a drop off in activity as we went out from perihelion to aphelion. So that's just a suggestion from the data. We can't really prove it yet. But it's unlikely that we could use that to actually age the asteroid, just because there's all these other factors and forces that would actually change the, the particle rate. Okay, so Stan was wondering, uh, why would the material preferentially accumulate in the equatorial region? 
So now you're asking a question that I'm not an expert in. <laughs> well, maybe that's the maybe that's one of the big research areas is to discover that. Too, so. it, it actually was. Yes, that was one of the first things that the uh, our radio science dynamicist actually did notice. Um, one part is that because I mean it's not obvious when you look at this picture, but <clears throat> the equatorial region does stick out furthest from the asteroid. So if you've got particles that are in close orbits or coming close, it would preferentially run into the ridge itself and it would start building up. I wish I could give a better, more insightful question. But like I said, I'm not a dynamicist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Richard asks, and so kind of sticking with the sample site, will the team make an effort to observe the sample site to see how the surface was disrupted after the contact? Yeah, I really... A lot of us were hoping that that would happen. Um, the decision was made. I mean, the, the goal of this mission is to collect the sample and return it safely to Earth. And once the sample is collected, and now that we're backed away from the asteroid, we've done the risk analysis and decided that it's probably not worth the risk to go back closer to the asteroid and image it. So at this point in time, there are no plans to do that. But it would have been a great, I would love to have seen that observation. So I know that, uh, so Blaine is wondering, and I know that you probably, you know you filled up the, uh, the sample containers, but, uh, and you had how much you were anticipating, but do you have any idea of how much material was actually collected to bring back to Earth? Oh, I mean, we, we you know, we're aiming for 60 grams. We know the sample head can collect up to about two kilograms. So we're thinking we definitely have hundreds of grams. I don't know if we got two kilograms, but we got quite a bit. That's a goodly amount. Yeah. I mean, that's a couple so pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd be really good. So let's, um, you know, Joe asked, this is actually a, an interesting question. Was there any damage to the spacecraft during the collection? The only damage, and if you call it damage, <clears throat> is that we did notice that a lot of our instruments are less, their sensitivity has gone down. So our optics are coated with Bennu dust. Not a lot, but you know, factor two at most. So that's the only real damage. Um, haven't heard anything from the spacecraft as to whether the panels themselves are coated. I'm assuming they would be, but no real damage other than the fact that, <clears throat> you know, you just took a leaf blower to, you know, a dirt pile right next to your telescope and it, you probably wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> Okay, so Joey asked, uh, why, why was it they used nitrogen to loosen and uh, um, to vacuum up the sample? Because nitrogen is inert. It doesn't react with anything. So the nitrogen wouldn't actually react with any of the material on the surface and wouldn't contaminate it or change it in any way. Okay, and so in thinking about the compositions, then Linda asked, uh, do you know what the compositions are of the dark boulders and the bright boulders? A lot of that is going to have to wait until we actually get the sample back. And even when we zoom down to, uh, you know, very high resolution, you can see bright flecks and dark flecks mixed together. So when that sample comes back, you can't really tell a lot from spectroscopy. You can tell a few things, like we can tell that the surface was hydrated that there actually is water attached to a lot of these minerals. The surface has lots of uh, organics and carbonates. But you, and of course we saw pyroxene, but it's hard to tell the exact mineralogy from the spectroscopy and the photometry. So a lot of that is gonna have to wait till we get the sample back. And uh, so Dennis asked actually very early on, what analyses of the samples will be done once we have them back on Earth? Oh, just about anything you can do to a rock. Um, the, the plan is, the initial plan was, you know, you collect 60 grams and we were only going to study 20 grams and the other, or 15 grams and the other three quarters of the sample was going to be put in storage. So as new techniques are developed, new instruments are developed, we can actually study those at a later time. But some of the things we hope to do is not only determine what Bennu is made of, but also do like radioactive isotopic analysis. Can we measure exactly when Bennu material formed? You know, it goes back to the early solar system, but also a lot of these radiotopic uh, clocks get reset when there's a traumatic event. 
So the hope is that we'll, you know, have a bunch of material that goes back four and a half billion years, and then we'll have a bunch of material that was reset when Bennu's parent body was disrupted, that impact that caused the release of all these small carbonaceous objects. Maybe we'll even have evidence of not catastrophic, but major impacts on the surface. So the hope is that using these radioactive isotopic analyses, we can really figure out what this asteroid has been doing for the last four and a half billion years. So once we bring the uh, samples back, so Chris and Annette asked, how will contamination be avoided on the return to Earth? Right, so one thing we had in the sample return capsule, actually in the head in the sample return capsule, actually I think it is in the sample return capsule, is what's called the contamination plate. So this is a plate that's been exposed to space and there will be contaminants. I mean, the fuel that we use, the hydrazine, is a contaminant and I'm sure the hydrazine got all over everything. It's probably all over that asteroid now. So you do have this contamination plate. So you can say, okay, the things on this plate are stuff that accumulated over the course of the mission. Heck, probably accumulated even before the spacecraft was launched when it was sitting on the rocket in Florida or when it was sitting in the, the bay there at Kennedy Space Center. And so by recognizing the contamination you see on that plate, you can then go, okay, the things we're seeing there, we can disregard within the sample. But once it lands, I mean, it's hermetically sealed. There should be no air or water getting into it when it lands in Utah in September, 2023. And then immediately we pick it up, fly it to Johnson Space Center and use their, their curation facilities, the same facilities that go back to the Apollo days. Okay, so we're getting close to the end here. I think we're gonna go for uh, two more questions. And I apologize to everyone. We've got some really good questions mm -hmm. here, but uh, you know, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. And so um, let's, you know, these are kind of some interesting ones. We had, um, uh, we'll kind of lump them. Robert was wondering, what is the gravity of this asteroid? And then Mike and Jinky were wondering how much would a 150 pound person weigh on Bennu? Oh, well, I can tell you it's microgravity. It's 10 to the negative fifth Earth gravities, <clears throat> Earth gravity. It's really, really small. So those particles that we're seeing being thrown off the surface, just to give you an idea, the escape velocity, the average escape velocity from the surface of Bennu is 20 centimeters a second. That's it. So if you were on the surface and you were throwing a baseball, not only would you throw the baseball off the surface, you'd probably kick yourself off the surface as well. I mean, completely out of orbit. So we had several questions. This will be the last question. And, and so uh, several were kind of alluded to this was uh, how this OSIRIS-REx um, compares and complements the Hayabasa uh, uh, missions. And so how are those working together to you know, kind of compare notes, so, so to speak? Yeah, so we've actually worked very closely with the, <clears throat> the Hayabusa team. Um, in fact, it helps that our principal investigator, Dante Loretta, learned the Japanese when he was an undergrad. So he actually can, you know. And so the first Hayabusa mission went to the asteroid Itakawa, which is an ordinary chondritic asteroid. It's an S-type. So a completely different type of asteroid than the two uh, carbonaceous asteroids that we went to. And the interesting thing about Ryugu and Bennu is that dynamically, and if you even look at their shape and sizes there, they should have formed in the same part of the main belt, in the inner main belt. So they could be related asteroids. They could actually be from the same parent body. But there are differences. The colors are slightly different. And like I said before, Bennu is hydrated. It shows evidence of water, at least trapped within the crystalline structure of the minerals on the surface. Ryugu is bone dry. So here we have two objects that look like they should be dynamically and physically look like they should have formed in the same part of the solar system, maybe even from the same kind of objects, and yet one has water and one is dry. And maybe that's telling us something about the diff different evolutionary paths they took over the history of the solar system. So it's very complimentary to go to multiple objects, because just because you've gone to one doesn't mean you know everything. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carl. This is absolutely wonderful and, and uh, really timely. We had a good crowd. Um, here and I, I think that we counted uh, between YouTube and the people here on 
on Zoom, we had probably in the neighborhood of 250 people out there, nice. maybe more. Mm -hmm. So we probably had multiple people at each site. And so thank you, Carl, for joining us this evening. And thank you, everyone else, for tuning in. Thanks for so, having me. Yeah. So you'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We'll make sure that this uh, presentation is posted on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel. It should already be there um, because it live stream, but it will also be up on the Night Sky Network webpage um, within a couple of days as well. Join us for our next webinar on Thursday, December 17th, when Robert Nemiroff will share with us highlights from the Astronomy Picture of the Day archive for 2020. That was one of our more popular webinars last year. And so Robert is uh, joining us again this year to share with us the best of APOD for the year. So keep looking up and we'll see you next month. And we're still here, but um, this is fantastic. So this is, uh, um, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see um, you know, to keep following and, and to, you know, it's going to be exciting for the, the capsule to